Our Father and our God, in Jesus' name we come to you, Lord, just humbly. Because, Lord, we all had different days today. We are all at different spots in our faith. Lord, uh, literally different distances from you spiritually right now. And we pray that uh, this is a time to draw us all closer. So I pray, Lord, for the quietness of our hearts, just a stillness to know that you are God, Lord, and that there be no question about it. So God, I pray that you use your word tonight to meet each and every person exactly where they are and that you would be glorified in our hearts and that your son, Lord, would be exalted, not just here, but everywhere, for he is our God and our King, in whose name we pray, amen. So John chapter 4, um, John 4 starts with, says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, but he needed to go through Samaria. So if you're looking on a map, what you would see is Judea, and they want to go to Galilee. So Judea would be in the south, Galilee would be in the north, and Samaria would be right in between. And it says he needed to go through Samaria, and I don't think this need is due to the location of Samaria. It's not saying Samaria is in his way, so, he's, he, so he needs to go through it to get to the other side, because the Jews would typically go out of their way to avoid Samaria. They would literally uh, cross to the east side of the Jordan, cross the Jordan River, get to the east side of the Jordan River, and then head north until they got past Samaria, then cross back over the Jordan uh, to get to Galilee, completely avoiding Samaria, even though it added uh, much distance to their journey. And being on foot or some sort of horseback, that would have been quite an ordeal. But they found it worthwhile to do it to avoid uh, Samaria. So the fact that this says that he needed to go through Samaria is probably not saying because it's in his way to get to Galilee. It's probably saying because of the woman he's about to meet there. Now that's quite a statement to make because it presumes providence, doesn't it? There's got to be providence for Jesus to need to go through Samaria, that there be a woman there. And what I want to just kind of get your attention towards tonight is this. This woman that Jesus is going to meet in some very large respects represent you and I, and in some very large respects represents something much bigger that we'll see at the end. And I'll just leave it at that in case you're tempted to leave early. You'll never know then. Okay. So he needed to go through Samaria. Now, when Assyria conquered Israel... When Assyria conquered Israel in the 700s BC, they left some Jews there, and they also transported some Assyrians there. So you had a mixture of Jews and Assyrians there, and they would intermarry, and that's how they became Samaritans. So Samaritans were half Assyrian, half Jewish, and that made the Jews despise them because the Jews were supposed to stay pure to their own uh, heritage. So... The Samaritans were the ones that violated that, that caused this despising of them by the Jews and made it worthwhile for them to avoid them altogether. So, verse 5. It says, So Jesus came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now, what I want to help you guys to see, and this is the stuff that completely ignited this permanent fire of excitement in me for the Bible. It's the very stuff I'm about to share with you. It trained my eye to see things that um, you just don't normally see in the Bible. Okay, so first I want to give you a term that if you've been with me for any period of time, you've probably heard it. But this term is very, very important. It's called logographic necessity. Logographic necessity. Logo is from, from the word, Greek word word. Graphic is writing. And necessity, you probably know pretty well. Uh, so it's basically saying this. 
Every word is necessary in the Bible. Okay, every word is necessary. The Bible doesn't give you just some details just to be talkative or just to be overly informative. It's telling you details because they matter towards the story. So in this case, we see some things that are very important for us to know. Let me start with this. If you read, if you were a first century Israelite, a first, and you just read that Jesus sat by a well, this would be about the fourth time you would have seen one of your heroes sit by a well. The other three times would be folks like Isaac's servant who went out to find him a bride. When did he find Isaac a bride? When he sat by a well and Rebecca shows up. And Rebecca is praised beauty and her purity and her character. And Isaac is obviously one of the heroes of the faith. So you see this equal yoking, a great man with a great woman. It's equally yoked. It's what I uh, honestly tell my, my high schoolers is not many college graduates end up marrying high school dropouts. High school dropouts typically marry high school dropouts and college graduates, college graduates, typically. Um, there's usually an equal yoking that happens about kind of where you're at in life. So, you, so what I share with them, and take this for whoever could use it, is instead of trying to find the right person, try to become the right person. Because when you invest in yourself, you're actually making yourself a better catch, which would make you equally yoked to better people sort of thing. And then you look at me and Diana and say, how'd you get her? And I know. So there you go. <laughs> that was cold. That was, that was a... That was flattering. That was good. Yeah. Somebody explain the joke to Richard, please. I was being... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now. All right. So, so when Isaac finds Rebecca at a well, then you get his son Jacob, who sure enough sits down by a well, and here comes Rachel, who's largely praised for her beauty and her integrity and being a great woman. And she gets to marry Jacob. Now, of course, he gets fooled into marrying Leah. And that will be significant for our story because Jacob could not love Leah. And the Bible says it was sadly because she was unlovely. So you see the shallowness of Jacob there that it says he cannot love the unlovely. And we're about to meet a Samaritan woman who's going to be the unlovely woman of the New Testament. And you're going to hear her heart's cry when she says to Jesus, are you greater than our father Jacob? She needs somebody who can love the unlovely because you're going to see she has a very difficult romantic past in a few verses from now. So then you have Moses as he goes to a well and there's um, shepherds there who are driving out these women away from the well for the water and Moses drives the shepherds away. And sure enough, one of the women that's there is Zipporah, who becomes his wife. So as I often say, the well of the Old Testament was the little happy hour hotspot of the Old Testament, right? <laughs> okay, now, so great men found their great brides at wells in the Old Testament. So it would very much spark the attention of these first century readers and certainly the 12 apostles that Jesus sits by a well, the anticipation would be, is he actually going to find a bride? Is Jesus going to actually find a bride at this well? Now, this is not the Catholic understanding of brides where Jesus, or I'm not sorry, not the Catholic, but some liberal views of Christianity where Jesus got married and all of that. It's not that. We are called the bride of Christ as the church, correct? So is he finding a bride at this well would be the question that's being asked. And if he is going by this well to find a bride, what must his equal yoking look like? Imagine being equally yoked to Jesus Christ. I hope you can, you know, what do you like to do in your free time? You'd ask her and she'd say, walk on water or, you know, something like that. That would be an equal yoking to Jesus Christ, right? So, <laughs> this stuff isn't funny, but that you're laughing cracks me up. So um, so who could possibly be equally yoked to Jesus Christ is something that would get sparked from these verses we just read. Another thing is this. Who was just mentioned twice in these verses? Jacob. You're going to see a lot of Jacob references going on here. And if you remember way back to chapter 1, I think it was in our second meeting, I was showing all the Jacob references that had to do with Nathaniel. So when you dive into 
Jacob's story, you can see the connections that are being made between Nathaniel and Jacob. Well, when you see somebody mentioned multiple times in a story from the Old Testament here, I would encourage you to really rehearse the story of that Old Testament person and see what connections come up. So Jacob mentioned twice here. This story is best understood in light of Jacob's story. And the third detail that I want to give you is for some reason, the Holy Spirit wants you to know what time of day this was happening. Now, what time of day did it, does it say this was happening? The sixth hour, which according to their clocks would be what time of day? High noon. Whatever hour they say it is, you start at 6 a.m. and count that many hours. So 6 a.m. plus the six hours will bring you to high noon. So the Bible wants you to know this. <clears throat> Jesus is sitting by this well at high noon, and that is the last time of day you would expect to find these women, because this is the desert, and it'd be smoking hot, and they always went at dusk when it was cooler, and they always went in groups, which was safer. So we're going to find a lot of unusual things happening with this woman here. So verse 7 says, A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now, you could probably look back and see that Jews did have some dealings with Samaritans. You will see that Jesus will send his disciples into Samaritan village to get a donkey for him to ride on and things like that. So there's some dealings that go on between Jews and Samaritans. But what never ever happened was you would never see them share meals or utensils or anything like that that was very unclean for a Jew to use a Samaritan's utensils of any sort or share meals with them or anything of those nature of that nature so you can see the shock of this woman now Jesus answered and said to her in verse 10 if you knew the gift of God and who it says to you give me a drink you would have asked him and he would get, would have given you living water now, so there's a conversation going on about water here. He says, give me a drink. And she says, wait a minute, there's, an, there's, a, there's a difference in our ethnicity here that would prevent this from happening. So why are you, being a Jew, asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? And Jesus says this, if you knew the gift of God, so how do we study this stuff? We ask ourselves questions as we go along. Now, what is the gift of God according to the Bible? It's eternal life. It's Romans 6, 23, right? The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So that's what Jesus, what's, that's what's on Jesus' mind as he's talking about water, right? It's eternal life. So now in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. And if you think of what a wage is, um, a wage is something that you've earned, you've deserved, it's something that your boss cannot withhold from you once you've worked for him. Once you've worked, it's your wage. It's not his wages, it's your wages. You earned it, you deserved it, it's yours, and nobody can keep it from you. Now, it says the wages that you've earned and deserve of your sin is death. Let's not underestimate sin. The Bible says it makes you earn and deserve death, right? So the wages of your sin is death, but then it says, but the gift of God, now, a gift is far different from a wage. A gift you haven't earned or deserved. It's freely given. It's the goodness of the gift giver that allows a gift to be a gift. So, it says the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Haven't earned it, haven't deserved it, but God wants to give it to us anyways. So, uh, what I want you to see here is this. He, he said this, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. What does that tell you? Salvation cannot be earned through works. It's free for the asking, isn't it? You just would have asked me. Isn't that tragic of people who don't receive it? You just would have asked me for eternal life. Okay? So she sits here 
as a Samaritan who has improperly worshipped for her entire life. You're going to see the questions that come up on worship, and Jesus is going to say, you don't even know what you're doing when it comes to worship. We know what we're doing as Jews. Salvation is from the Jews. You guys have had it wrong, but he says, but thankfully there's a time coming when uh, the, the, the qualifications for true worship will change. And we're going to see that in just a moment. So, uh, verse 11. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this living water? Now, before I go on, if you remember through Nicodemus' last chapter, and you remember through um, Nathaniel in chapter 1, they all have these questions that are going forth from Jesus where Jesus is trying to tell them heavenly truths. Like with Nicodemus, you must be born again. And with that heavenly truth, he has an earthly understanding, right? He talks about crawling back into his mother's womb. So I talked about the word behold, and it means you have to embrace truths of God and realize these truths are bigger than our ability to comprehend. So here again, we have somebody struggling over heavenly truth. He said, I would have given you living water. And she's looking and seeing he has no bucket. How can he offer her anything? Okay, He's incapable. The well is deep. Uh, you have nothing to draw with. You can't even get the water that you're telling me I'm going to thirst again. You can't give me anything, any water whatsoever. Okay, It's these earthly understandings that hinder us. So she then says this, are you greater than our father Jacob? There's the key question. Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well, drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? So here's the cry of her heart. She needs a greater Jacob. She needs somebody who can love the unlovely. And that's what we're going to be seeing happening here. Now, Jesus is always demonstrating to his Jewish audience that he is more worthy of their attention than their Old Testament heroes, whether it be Abraham or Moses or Solomon or um, Jonah. Um, he will specifically say of Solomon, one greater than Solomon is here. Um, so there's a different wisdom we've got to tap into than Solomon's wisdom. And what you see in Solomon's wisdom is the first nine Proverbs have a constant theme running through them of fleeing from the adulterous woman and marrying the Proverbs 31 woman. You flee from the adulterous, you marry the um, virtuous woman. And, and that's the key to wisdom, is, is what Proverbs has as an outline for it. And then you see Jesus say, but one greater than Solomon is here. And then in John chapter 8, he'll literally have an adulterous woman thrown at his feet. And Solomon would have told them what? Run. Run from that woman. But he doesn't run from her. He doesn't say, i got to run from you and find a virtuous woman. The greater wisdom of Christ is that you don't flee the adulteress and find the virtuous. You transform the adulteress into the virtuous. You and I were once in darkness, correct? He didn't leave us there. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. He didn't leave us there. It's all about transformation. And then Romans 12 will say, as a living sacrifice to Christ, be you, you be transformed, right? By the renewing of your mind. The old ways aren't going to cut it anymore, right? These earthly understandings are not going to cut it. You have to have heavenly understandings of these heavenly truths. It's all about transformation. I don't think Christianity is anything apart from it being about transformation. The old is gone. Behold, all things are new. You're a new creation in Christ. These are literal words coming from the Bible. It's all about being new. And how is Jesus greater than Solomon also? What's one of Solomon's most famous words that he's written? He wrote in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. It's a great frustration of the book of Ecclesiastes. There's nothing new under the sun. Jesus comes in Revelation says, behold, I make all things new. In other words, he's the answer to Solomon's problem, isn't he? So one greater than Solomon is here. How does he say he's greater than Jonah? Well, say he's greater than the prophet Jonah. He says uh, the people that uh, literally uh, repented at Jonah's preaching in Nineveh will judge the religious leaders of Jesus' day because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and one greater than Jonah is amongst them. 
So how much worse would it be to reject Jesus than it would be to reject Jonah? Okay. So Jesus is always showing that he's greater than these Old Testament uh, folks. Look at Adam, for heaven's sake. I don't know how long it was between Adam biting the fruit and Eve biting the fruit. But some people call it romantic, a romantic gesture that Adam, knowing that the penalty for eating that fruit is going to be death, he sees his wife come under the curse of death and he chooses to join her in that. And that seems like this great romantic move on his part, very Romeo and Juliet of him. Yet, what was his call to do, to be a type of Christ? In those moments between her eating the fruit and him eating the fruit, he was called to beg God that the curse of death would fall on him so that his wife could live. That is the love Ephesians 5 says a husband is to have for his wife, to replace her in death if need be, because you are the Christ figure in your home. And she is the church figure. And as Christ died for the church, you are to die for your, for your wife. <laughs> Look at the women looking at their husbands right now. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, especially that one in the back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a good night for you so far. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, now, Verse 13, Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Now let's just all confess, if we were this woman, we'd be scratching our heads saying, what is this man talking about? What kind of water must this be? Um, now, <clears throat> What Jesus is saying to her is, you've been drawing from the wrong well, and you have to keep coming back over and over and over again. So the question that I asked in my Bible some time ago, what wells am I drawing from? Wells of popularity? Is that what's moving me? Wells of um, riches? Um, wells of uh, power, authority? What are the wells that I'm drawing from? What is motivating me? What do I keep going back to that I find is not satisfying at all? And uh, one verse that has been sticking with me all year is Psalm 23, 1. That the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. And how I'm understanding that verse is there's a relationship between how much you allow the Lord to shepherd you and how needy and wanty you're going to be. So the more I allow him to shepherd me and I get rid of pride and anything that gets in the way of me trying to be God in my life instead of him, the more wanty and needy I become. But when I fully allow him to shepherd me, he's going to shepherd me in a way where never out of my mouth I'm going, but I just want or I just need or, you know, that I'm incomplete. His shepherding is perfect. Doesn't mean wealth, doesn't necessarily even mean my stomach's always full or any of those things. It simply means that spiritually I am content in all circumstances, um, no matter what comes my way. So that's why Paul will write Philippians from a jail cell, and you can't get away from the theme of Philippians is abundant joy, rejoicing and joy, and he's writing when his freedom was taken away for no good reason. Okay, So it's being content in all circumstances because the Lord is your shepherd, and that's the cause of your contentment, no matter what else is going on, these other wells that we go to that cause us to thirst again and again and again are the wells that lie to us, and we've got to replace those lies with the well of truth that is Jesus Christ. All right, um, 15. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. This is up to something. Okay, Jesus is up to something. Okay, The woman answered and said, I have no husband. And here's why I like this. Because Jesus is about to mention to her that she's had five husbands. She's currently living out of the wedlock with another man. And his conclusion to that is, you have no husband. And so he mentions six men. Five either passed away or divorced you or something happened with five of them. You're currently with a six that, for whatever reason, the decision was made, 
We'd rather live in the shame of our culture. That culture would have been a very much shame-based culture towards her living with him out of wedlock. And for some reason, you're okay with that, giving up on marriage or whatever the reason may be. And here's what Jesus says. You have no husband. And why I like that is this. Because Jesus stands before her as her seventh. This is her seventh husband. This is her bridegroom. And seven is that number of completion, isn't it? He's there. She's saying, are you greater than our father Jacob? And he's presenting himself as the bridegroom whom will, she will never want again. Now, very tactfully, she says, I have no husband. Very tactfully, Jesus said to her, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. I love the way he can tell her about her sin in a way of complimenting her on her truth-telling. You know, <laughs> it's true you have no husband. Here's the real deal. And he spells it out. And he goes, so in that you've spoken truly. You don't have a husband. And when I say to couples that are living together out of wedlock, I quite frankly say to the girl, that's not a husband. It's not what a husband does. Okay, a husband would marry you um, before that. Now, and 90% of the population strongly disagrees with me, but so be it. All right. So Jesus stands before her as her seventh. Now, verse 18. Uh, and the one that you have now is not your husband, and that you spoke truly. 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. That's pretty easy to, to pick up at this point. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. when confronted without question in your sin. You're confronted in your sin. You're caught. There's no way out. What do you do? Change the subject, right? Change the subject completely. Now, why this is so relevant, though, and I'll be honest with you, probably for years and years and years, I thought this is like this parentheses in the text. It's like the worship part doesn't have anything to do about the woman and what Jesus is doing with her. It's almost like an interruption about worship. But I don't see that anymore that way. Understanding that she's bringing up a question on worship and saying, we Gentiles worship differently than you Jews worship, so which one is correct? And Jesus is going to say, you know what? A new way of worshiping is coming in that's in spirit and truth. It's not going to matter location-wise anymore. It's going to matter heart-wise. Uh, your wor That's how your worship is going to be. I see that he's taking this non-Jewish woman and saying that non-Jewish people are going to worship the same exact way as Jewish people, if Jesus is the object of that worship. If you worship in spirit and you worship in truth, with, of course, we're going to know that Jesus is the object of that worship, he's bringing Gentile and Jewish communities together through this woman. That's why she is known as representing the church here. Because the church is where all nations, tribes, and tongues are to worship together. So in this, what I used to think was an interruption, Jesus says, um, well, the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. This is Mount Gerizim in Samaria. And you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place one ought to worship, at the temple in Jerusalem. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Now, this is where the charge, and I sat with a Jewish woman today for two hours. Somebody brought me a Jewish woman for two hours to sit and, and speak with. And the big, one of the big things was, um, do you know? Kept, kept bringing up, do you know? Is there evidence? Do you know? Do you know? We can know certain things. I have a student who's saying to me now, he's going towards that agnostic way, saying, I don't know that anybody can know. Okay, what I want to say is, we have discovered that we can know things. It's, there's a whole study called epistemology. It's how we actually know things. So her question largely was, how do you know we have the Bible that was originally written by those authors? Like the telephone game, how do you know it wasn't changed? That's a question that's often asked. It's a good question. But there's very good answers to that. And when you look at those very good answers, you see that the Bible is literally the most trustworthy ancient document on our planet. 
so says secular testing. These aren't biased uh, religious scholars saying this. This is what every ancient manuscript goes to to test its authenticity and reliability. Uh, the entire Bible passes that with flying colors, but the New Testament is known to be the single most trustworthy document on our planet from antiquity. Isn't that good to know? Okay? And quite frankly, and I want to share this bit with you, the, the conversation became between how she feels is what she feels is true, and I kept saying, no, I, I don't trust how I feel. We've got to go by what we know. What does evidence show us? Um, it's not good enough to say, I feel that man is guilty, so therefore go ahead and electrocute him. You've got to know, and the way you know is through evidence, correct? That is what sets Christianity apart from others. That's what allows me to say, I'm going to literally give my entire career and my private life and every part of my life over to Christ. Because she kept saying, but it's faith, but it's faith, but it's faith. And I kept trying to say, but listen to how we define faith. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. Okay, It's the substance of things hoped for. There's substance to it, and it's the evidence of things not seen. This is not a blind faith, folks. This is not wishful thinking. This is where, when you apply the rules of evidence that are used in courts of law and things like that, it's the best explanation for all the evidence. We talked about the flood today. We talked about fossil record. We talked about macro revolution today. We talked about how texts get brought down to us over the centuries. We talked and we talked and we talked. Okay? And every one of those things is why I'm a Christian. Okay? It's why I hold on to Christianity, quite frankly, rather easily. Because it's what Peter said. Uh, Jesus said, do you guys want to leave me too? He said, where else am I to go? You have the words of eternal life. He says, where else are you going to go? The evidence is in Christianity. Jesus says, we know what we worship. We know. Okay, salvations of the Jews. So, here's what I wrote in my Bible, and... I've been saying this a lot lately, and I think it's important. Um, the, the question becomes, can this really be this exclusive? Can there really only be one way? Because, of course, that's another topic that got brought up today. So what about these people, these people, these people? Can there truly only be one way? And in that sense, Christianity is very exclusive. There's one way. But the exclusivity is entirely inclusive to whoever wants to participate. So no individual will ever be not included who wants to be included. But there's one way. And all are invited to that one way. Um, and it's not a new invention of the apostles. It's not their own creativity trying to make their friend more important than he really is. We see this one way to be saved throughout the entire Old Testament. <laughs> God says to Noah, build an ark according to the specs that I give you. And how many doors did he tell him to make? One. So when that water came and you don't want to drown, you don't have a lot of choices, do you? You go through the one door. If you're in that door, you'll live. If you're outside of that door, you will die. Then you get to Rahab's door. Tie a scarlet cord on that door. And they said, bring you, your family, whoever. They said, whoever's in that door will live. Whoever's outside of that door will die. You get to the Passover door. Sprinkle blood on the frame and the doorpost. Whoever's in that door will live. Whoever's outside of that door will die. And then Jesus comes along in John chapter 10 and says, I am the door. If you're in me, you will live. If you're outside of me, you will die. Okay? But he certainly doesn't say this is just for Jews or just for Gentiles or just for any specific group whosoever believes. So, she, so we know what we worship for salvations of the Jews, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So worship... You know, um, recently one of my students said, how can you stay close to God? You know, how do you keep the reality 
of God in front of you when you can't see him? And the answer is, that's exactly what a spiritual dis discipline is for. It's what Bible reading is for, is to keep you close to God. It's what worship is for. It's what church attendance is for. It's what prayer and fasting is for. These things keep the spiritual reality of God alive in your spirit. Remember, he's looking for you to worship in spirit and truth. The truth is in your spirit. You're going to see all sorts of things that may not agree with what this says. But you're not a, to worship by sight. Okay? You're not to worship by feelings. Okay? Your feelings ought to come because your spirit that God gave you when he saved you is so communing with his spirit. That's what creates the worship in you. Okay? So it's not... And that's why the words are so important, because truth is a part of your worship, right? Whoever writes these songs has got to be absolutely certain they're giving you the truth of the Bible in every one of those songs. Okay? That's why the song Reckless Love became controversial. Everybody loves that song Reckless Love, and it became, but is his love reckless? I mean, reckless means you don't know the outcome. You're just being reckless with it, and who knows what will happen. So, and, and people go, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? Well, quite frankly, the big deal is if it's not reckless love, we shouldn't sing about his reckless love. We can sing about his overwhelming love or his nothing will stop his love or, or, or something. But one of the things that doesn't describe him at all is the word reckless. Okay? Great song, though. Great song. Just, it's not reckless. He knows exactly what he's doing. Okay? He knows exactly what he's doing all the time. All right. Can't imagine how many people have offended already, but <laughs> uh, where am I? Twenty-five. All right. Twenty-five. The woman said to him, "I know that Messiah is coming, who's called Christ. When he comes, he'll tell us all things." So, in other words, she has a hope for something. She says, "I may not have all the answers. I may not be in a good position in life right now, but I have this hope." I know my scriptures well enough to know that Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he'll tell us all things. So <clears throat> here's a woman, five husbands, in and out of marriage five times for whatever reason, currently not in the institution of marriage, even though she's living with another man. And she says, yet I have this hope set for this future Messiah to come and inform us of all things. Now, Jesus said to her in verse 26, I who speak to you am he. I think that had to be... I think nobody ever more sincerely said, oh my gosh, I just got goosebumps than this woman in this moment. Okay? Can you possibly imagine that your hope is set on someone and you know that someone is going to be someone so powerful that these five husbands couldn't compare to, they couldn't come close to, and now when he comes, he'll tell me everything I need to know and I'm going to be good. And now she hears these words from this guy who she just confessed, I know you're a prophet. So there's already this credibility going. And now he says, but I who speak to you am he. This is the satisfaction of her hopes. This is her future hope made present. Her future hope in the flesh in front of her. And I was just saying to somebody the other day, because of this virus and everything, that you know, Paul, Paul says the greatest three things are faith, hope, and love, right? And the greatest of these is, is love. Love gets its time from the pulpit. Faith gets its time from the pulpit. That gets taught on regularly. When do you ever, when are you ever taught on hope? When do we ever get taught on hope? <laughs> Not tonight either. But, well, a little bit maybe. Okay. So, um, hope is one of the big three, and it goes largely ignored. So, what is hope? Hope is commonly used to mean a wish. Its strength is in the strength of the person's desire. I hope, I wish, okay? Dolphin fans, you know how that feels, right? <laughs> Gets let down quite a bit, all right? All right, I'm a Bills fan, and I'm with you. All right, now, so the, the strength of that type of hope lies in the person's own desire for the outcome, right? However strong you are, that's how strong your hope is. But biblical hope is the confident expectation of what God has promised and its strength of that hope lies in his ability to deliver on his promise. So it's not a hope of maybe it'll happen, maybe it won't. I hope it does. It's based on the credibility of the promise giver 
that you know that he cannot lie. You know that he's delivered on all his promises to this point. So you rest in that confident hope of a certainty of a future expectation. This is not a wishy-washy hope, uh, that how we use the word hope. This is a certain hope. It wouldn't make the big three of faith, hope, and love if it was the wishy-washy, it may or may not happen. It's a confident expectation that God will deliver on his promises based on his character and based on his history of delivering on promises. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, uh, Paul puts it this way, starting in verse 15. He says, and in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of you to Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on my way to Judea. Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do it lightly? Or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? So he's saying, listen, I plan on coming to you, but it's not this plan that is wishy-washy, where maybe it's yes, maybe it's no. That's not how I'm planning these things. But he says, but as God is faithful, our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him they are amen to the glory of God through us. He's saying there's a wishy-washy hope, and that's not how I'm planning on coming to see you. I'm coming by way of the Holy Spirit. Remember he had the Macedonian vision? He's saying, I got that from God, so I know I'm coming to you. It's a certain hope, because in God, if God gives that to me, his promises are not yes and no. They're yes and amen in God, because he is faithful. It's what we can rely on. This is what our hope is based on. Romans 5, 15, 13 says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all peace in thinking, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's this abounding in hope, powered by the Holy Spirit, that lives in you, that fills us with this hope, this certain expectation of future events. And what is that? Well, again, one of the things I heard today was, what about you know, babies that are ill and things like that? How could God you know, allow that to happen and so forth? And um, I told her what the Bible says about children. Jesus was very fond of children, wasn't he? He says, unless I become like one, I will not go to heaven. Okay, and how do I understand that? Well, I know this. Um, when you tell a little child about Jesus, they don't sit here and go, but what about, what about, what about? They just go, oh, and they'll go like this, and I love him. I said, Jesus will say, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, um, I've done enough where you as adults should say yes to Jesus, and I love him. Um, the faith of a child. Now, um, all right, moving on. To John 4, verse, 20, uh, verse um, 27, right? And at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Just keep in mind the word marveled, because this is one of our connecting points for tonight. So they marvel that he's talking with a woman, yet no one said, what are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They went out of the city, and they came to him. Now, this woman received salvation. She received living water. And because of logographic necessity, what was the detail to let you know that she received the living water? The Bible says that she left her water pot behind. She depended on to bring home the water that she knew, even though she consumed it, she would thirst again, right? Pot behind, because now the Bible's telling you she will never thirst again. She has received the living water, and, and um, she's going to tell others what she experienced. So she's going back into her villages, telling everybody what she just experienced. Verse 31 says, In the meantime, his disciple urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Did I skip anything? Did I skip? No. They went out and said it came to him. Good. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. I love that statement. Now, 
Don't apply earthly understandings to heavenly truths. He said, I have food to eat of which you, you do not know. And I know what I would have said. He's got a snicker bar up his sleeve, right? Okay. Wouldn't you? He's got food to eat that you don't know. About. Send us into the village to get food. But meanwhile, the guy's got it already, right? That's which, how we would understand that. So what is he talking about? Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And Jesus said to them, my food. Now think about how you pursue three square meals a day and probably a snack or two in between, right? Every single day. Okay, constantly pursuing food. Look at the counters behind you, for heaven's sake, what you did to those things. All right? <laughs> All right. So think about your pursuit of food. And now listen to Jesus. He says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. The nourishment that brings you life through food, Jesus said he gets through doing the will of his father. That's his nourishment. That's his food. That's what keeps him going. May that be said of you and I, that doing the will of the father is our breath. It's our nourishment. It's what keeps us going. It's why your car works best when you follow the owner's manual because you're doing the will of the maker of the car and the car functions best that way. This is your owner's manual. You function best when you're doing things the way God created you to do them and not whatever way you feel like or whatever way you want to do it, but you're obedient to your maker, the one who designed you, who knows how you operate best, and therefore you stay away from sin so that you're the most functional human being you can be. So he said, uh, my food is to do the will of sent him who sent me and finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? So whatever months this is, he knows and he knows that they know that in four more months is when they go into their fields and they gather all the food that's been um, sown in their fields. And this is the harvest time when they gather it all up. He says, you know that that's four months away. But behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes. And look at the fields. They are already white for harvest. Now I'm more than convinced that he's pointing at the horizon that she just disappeared over to go tell the villagers about him. And they're coming in their white robes towards him. And he says, you think the, the harvest is actual food. And you know that's four months away. But I'm telling you that I have food that you don't even know about. Lift up your eyes. You want to see a harvest? Look at these souls coming to me right now over the hor horizon. That's my food. That's what nourishes me. That's the will of the Father that those Gentiles that you despise so much that you walk way out of your way, crossing rivers to get around their territory. I shoot straight through their territory and here's an entire village of them that are going to be co-worshippers with you. They will worship in spirit and truth just like you will worship in spirit and truth. That's what nourishes me. Because that's what my Father wanted done. Okay? Okay? And he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit for eternal life. But both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. He's making them disciples. He's training them as disciples. And he's going to send them out to the world. But Jesus came first to labor for them, to prepare the fields for them, so the way go go and labor in these fields, there's going to be a harvest in them. Okay, so Paul picks up on this in First Corinthians chapter three, starting in verse five. Paul will say, "Who then is Paul, or who's Apollos? But they're ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave to each one." I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Can you imagine a farmer puts a seed in the ground and pours water on it, and then when it becomes food, he goes, look what I did. And you just watered, you just planted. But God made the seed into food. God did that. Okay, God made that food into something that nourishes you. That's why I love talking to evolutionists and saying this Big Bang explosion where all this stuff that formed life are flying through outer space, every bit of it landed on this tiny speck of a planet and none of it landed anywhere else. The very people that need peas and carrots and tomatoes, the peas and carrots and tomatoes landed on this planet, the same planet that the people landed on. 
Isn't that lucky? Okay? And it just so happens that the ground that's dirt, that if it gets on your hands, you wash it off because it's dirty, is actually soil that turns a seed into your salad. It's a miracle. It's a miracle that we can't reproduce in any shape, manner, or form. And we take it for granted like nothing. So he says, listen, I plant, you water, but God has to cause the increase. So he's saying, you're entering into other people's labor, and you're going to see the fruit of their labor. He's saying this, the gospel is one great cooperation of believers. This is the cooperation of the gospel. 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all that I ever did. So this woman goes and says, listen, he told me about my five husbands, told me I'm living out of wedlock with a guy, told me all that I ever did. That may be an exaggeration, or maybe we missed a whole lot. They didn't write down a whole lot that he told her. I don't know. But here's what I do know. I used to say this. I used to say, see, your test, the test in your life for this woman that was these relationships is now her testimony, all right? So God uses the test in your life for your testimony. And then somebody went up to me on that. I think he might even be in the room. He said, uh, he says, no, her mess became her message. And I said, yeah, that's better than mine. So I'm going to use that one from now on. Her mess became her message. Isn't that just like God? Her mess became her message. And her message became the thing that transformed an entire village for Christ's sake. So when the Samaritans had come to him, they urged him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Logographic necessity, right? He stays there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Again, they don't feel it. They know it, correct? They can know it, that he's the Savior of the world. Now, Christianity, listen, when I'm trying to encourage kids to go to college and stay true to their faith, knowing that many of these colleges will come against them hardcore against their faith. And I say, I hope Christianity costs you some friends. I hope it costs you some uh, embarrassment because you won't go to the party that everybody else is going to. I hope it costs you something because you don't truly own something until it costs you something. What do you own right now that didn't cost you something? You want to own your faith, let it cost you something. These, these guys are saying now, we believe not because of what you said. Why are they owning it? They said because now we believe because we heard him. We left whatever we were up to. And this woman who they could not have given a whole lot of credibility to because of her life, they gave credibility to, and they show up, and now we're talking about them even tonight because they are worshipers in spirit and truth like you and I. he departed from there and went to Galilee for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country so when he came to Galilee the Galileans received him having seen all the things he did in Jerusalem at the feast for they had also gone to the feast here's how I want to finish this starts with Jesus being thirsty at a well correct and he said give me a drink Gee, this isn't the only time Jesus will become thirsty He'll cry out from the cross, I am thirsty. And they offer him a drink. And the question I have is this, what is he thirsty for? Because he's about to bring to salvation a thief that's right next to him. And he's about to bring to salvation trillions of people that will follow him, including you and I. I think he's thirsty for souls again, brought about now by the living water that will flow from his side when a Roman spear jabs him in the heart. And I think he's thirsty for evil in this world to end because the connection that I want to show you tonight is in Revelation 17. An unmistakable comparison is being made here to the Samaritan woman. She's not only a type of the church, she is the type of transformation that allows the book of Revelation to end 
with a statement of no more evil in heaven, no more crying, no more pain, no more death, no more suffering. All the evil is gone. And in Revelation 17, we get this picture of a woman who's the epitome of all evil. She's um, the sum total of the world's sin wrapped up in one figure of this woman. Let's pick it up in verse 1 of Revelation 17. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Remember the cup that Jesus was praying away in the Garden of Gethsemane? Take this cup from me. This is it. This is the cup filled with the abominations of the earth. Every lie you ever told is in that cup. Every test you cheated on, every lustful thought you had, everything you've ever done wrong, the whole world, the Hitlers, the Stalins, and the yous and the me's. All of our sin is in this cup. And this is what Jesus has to drink down that he's sweating over in Gethsemane. And this is a picture of it. And the, the blood of the martyrs is in this cup. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abomination of the earth. So she's then. But it says mystery, and most people say these things are mystery, these are a mystery. But there's a problem with saying that now as we read on, verse 6. It says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled. There's that word again. This is the same John who marveled that Jesus was talking with a woman at the well, correct? So where in John's view, nobody, no Jewish man should ever be talking to the Samaritan woman, and they marvel that he does. So when John's encountered this woman, and it says she's drunk with the blood of the saints, she has uh, the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication in this cup, and he says, when I saw her eye, you would think it would say ran, screamed, whatever. But this is John who knows Jesus, and what does he say? I marveled. I just pictured John seeing this epitome of all evil and going, I wonder what Jesus is going to do with her. I know how he treats women. All right? Let's see how he treats this one. He says, I marvel in great amazement. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery. So should we say that this is a mystery we just can't know? The angel says, listen, why do you marvel? I'll tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has seven heads and ten horns. The beast that you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. And those who dwell on the earth will marvel whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they see the beast that was and is not and yet is. Here is the mind which has wisdom. We talked about the different wisdoms here, right? You have Solomon's wisdom where John would have ran from this harlot. Then you have Christ's wisdom. And John's saying, if you're going to know the mystery, you have to apply wisdom. So he says, here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. These are also seven kings. Now see if anything sounds familiar to you here. These are also seven kings. Five have fallen. One is, and the other has not yet come. Jesus says, the truth is you've had five husbands. And the one who now is, is not your husband that you're currently seducing. And as Jesus stood before her as her seventh, this says, and one has not yet come. And this says, when he comes, he must continue a short time. What did they say to Jesus? Stay a while. It says he stayed two days. He continued a short time with them. It's, it's the same story, isn't it? It's the same story. Now, so what does this mean? I was hoping you could tell me. Here's what I think it means. You see, you see Jesus constantly transforming these women. And we know in heaven, all the stuff of this woman is gone. And we know that she sound, this woman sounds just like the Samaritan woman, right? In every detail. And we know she got transformed. I think this is showing this transformation of all evil in heaven 
to where it's gone. In other words, the most extreme example I could think of that I think is true is um, the guy from Gainesville, the serial killer from Gainesville. What was his name? Not Bundy. He was Tallahassee. That's the Seminoles. I need the Gators killer. <laughs> uh, who was the awful guy? Um, no. Um, no. He, 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 was, he would eat them. He would... Jeffrey Dahmer. Thank you. Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, it doesn't get much worse when you're a serial killer who then has sex with your dead victims and then you eat them. That's terrible. Okay, and so that's Jeffrey Dahmer, and as he's sitting on death row, um, and he's working out because you know if you're a serial violent serial killer, we want to make you stronger. Apparently, he's working out. Other death row inmates come and take the barbell and crush his neck with it and kill him. So you know you're pretty low when other death row inmates go. You're pretty low, and they kill him. And as they clean out his cell, they find Chuck Colson's book on his bed. Okay, and when they found Chuck Colson, who does prison ministry, his book on the bed, they were saying, is he a Christian? And the chaplain of this prison said he gave his life to Christ. And so many people will say, that ain't right. He should not, he, he should not be in heaven. And I remember somebody saying to me, how, how do you think his victims would feel if he were in heaven? I said, I think they're more rejoicing in them over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous who have no need of repentance. Listen, the Savior that you worship is not so small that Jeffrey Dahmer is hopeless if he gives his life over to him. And I know it's not a comfortable thought, but it's, a, it's, a, it's the capability of the Savior. It's the power of repentance. It's the transformations that we're talking about because this woman is worse than Jeffrey Dahmer. And there's only one other woman that shows up between here and the end of your Bible. And it's the bride of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Okay? It's transformation. Okay? So the wicked can be made right. And I think the Bible uses the Samaritan woman to build hope and to people who would say this, and you hear this all the time, God could never forgive me. You have no idea what I've done. He could never forgive me. People feel that way, don't they? They'll hear about Jesus. They'll nudge his way, and they'll go, but you don't know what I've done. He could never, ever forgive me. This is their hope. This is their hope. You can't be so good that you don't need Jesus. You can't be so bad that he can't be your Savior. It's exclusive in the way to heaven. It's inclusive in all who can take part in it. That's our Jesus. Father, we thank you for um, this time, and I thank you, uh, Lord, just for your power and your willingness to save. And God, I pray that through this room, many people will come to salvation um, as we go our separate ways to homes, work, uh, our streets, our, our neighborhoods. Lord, may our salvation not just be about us, but be about so many people we don't even know, Lord, that um, we could tell them that we worship what we know, because we know Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. So God, help us to desire the food of doing your will and to see that harvest come in. In Jesus' name, amen.